So in order to start my conversation, I will start first with, um, just for six minutes, uh, drum. And I want to, con if you can just highlight, you know, the issue of definition and concept are extremely important for you to address any problem. Transnational organized crime is one of them. So I would really like you, if you could touch a bit of how the Lermo Convention, that actually playing a very important role for the African state to counter transnational organized. To what level this convention define organized criminal groups and transnational organized crime? Please, you are welcome. Merci beaucoup, uh, Monsieur Luca. Thank you so much, Mr. Luca. Thank you so much, Catherine. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to participate in this webinar and to speak of this question of transnational organized crime. To before answering the question, I would like to uh, remind bring up the United Nations Convention of Palerme and that was signed uh, at Palerme that is uh, also an homage to a judge uh, who was uh, killed in his uh, work. And so we want to continue fighting against transnational criminal cr organized crime and put into place a cooperation between the police and, and justice. Inter so we want to have cooperation between the two on an international level, that's very important. The convention also uh, addresses uh, human trafficking um, and the illegal traffic traffic of anything. In terms of the definition of organized criminality, there is no one precise definition. But in, in general, we it can be individual acts or group acts. Here, when we are speaking of organized crime, we are speaking of premeditated crimes undertaken by a group that decide to um, engage in criminal activities. And so in terms of the Convention of Palerme, we realized that if we make a list of the crimes, this list could be, uh, could could be a changing list. And today we are speaking more of criminality than we did in the past. And here we, it was important to choose words carefully. When we analyze these activities, it is not only the crimes we are looking at, but also the actors, the authors of the crime. And this is a choice that was made at the convention so that organized criminality uh, can be better understood. So we dis decided to define the groups that were behind this criminality and in the convention, it says that criminalized groups are, can, are structured of uh, groups of three people or more that exist for a certain amount of time. It's a group that, that, that decides on a premeditated level to, to undertake serious offenses and that gets a financial benefit from their activity. And at the end of the convention, 
the expression of a serious crime. It's a crime that would have a sentence that the uh, the sentence of four years or more. And this sentence of four years was agreed to by all during the negotiations. And it was to show the, the seriousness of the crime. So the, the, we put in place a series of options and definitions that shows the complexities of the question. And this is why I mentioned the importance of the cooperation between both the police and the judicial. So what is a crime, international crime? Uh, according to Article 3 of the Convention, if a crime is taking place in more than one country, if it is committed in one country, but but its planning, for example, or its undertaking was also taking place in another country, or if the crime is committed in one state or country, but it, uh, in, in, it is committed in a state that, and then undertaken another state or that has implications in another state, then that also would be considered transnational. So there are several categories of crimes, as I suggested. In terms of the convention, there are several uh, crimes. There's like drug trafficking, there's the trafficking of human persons, environmental infractions, there's many crimes. And there are other crimes that can be considered uh, that can be considered transnational organized crime. And we're going to speak of two examples, what we call the uh, white collar crime that is connected to other crime. If we look at these two types of crime, there is a difference. What is that difference? The white collar crime is a deviation of legalities, whereas uh, organized crime is um, it's an activity that that is continuous and it is meant it is undertaken with the concept of profiting financially. And oftentimes white collar crime is only undertaken by one individual, but in transnational crime it has to be at least three people involved. So there can be, there can be economic criminality, there can be a financial criminality, there can be uh, money laundering, there can be issues at the borders and customs. And then of course, this all is linked closely to terrorism. Organized crime with terrorism, there is the connection. So it's considered terrorism if it's also identifying a population or, or uh, to disrupt a political or social events. Or, but, but we also have calculated the relationships between organized crime and terrorism. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. I, let, that, let us move on. Um, the second question is based on these definitions. I want you to relate it to the, the context of ECOWAS. It is one thing to have the convention, but how to contextualize convention to the level of the, uh, the regional, uh, regional economic communities or even to the state. So it would be good just to highlight, based on those definitions, how uh, who counts as uh, a criminal actor. But I want you to go to the uh, to the scale of ECOWAS. We know the regional economic communities do play a very important role in terms of defining 
organized crime and as well as coordinating a state response to this organized crime. Can you share with us, based on your wealth of experience with ECOWAS, of the main aspect of ECOWAS legal framework and policy strategies on transnational organized crime? And in here, I want to focus the, the attention on these criminal actors. Uh, is the approach of the ECOWAS similar to the approach of the other economic region, regional economic communities? And what value do you think, based on your experience, the regional economic communities framework and policies have have for the implementation of the UN Convention? Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, okay, okay. Merci, merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. En fait, j ai, j ai Thank travaillé. you. I worked in the context, in the, not directly with ECOWAS, but but in the implementation of, of uh, these uh, works at ECOWAS. So this means that we, we worked closely with ECOWAS to put in place an action plan for the benefit of the member states of ECOWAS. What we must recall first of all, is a community like uh, ECOWAS, in terms of the convention, there's the implementation and the, the policies. And we have the policies on the regional level, the state levels, but the priority of the convention is to guarantee each country its means of implementing these uh, policies. And at the regional level, whether it would be with ECOWAS or, or the CAC, they put into place action plans or strategies to fight to counter all of these forms of crime. Uh, for example, uh, we, we saw that at ECOWAS, we had states sign the convention. So the action plan of ECOWAS 2000 1920 is, is this action plan shows strategies that will allow the member states to have a better means of measuring the, the success of their policies. This was a policy uh, for the pertaining to the action plan. And it was a declaration that we realized after 10 years that it, we needed to add to this. And so we had the Supplementary Act that is, has a much stronger monitoring uh, for the implementation of these policies because ECOWAS realizes the necessity on a regional level to reinforce and strengthen cooperation uh, particularly considering extradition of persons and confiscating the profits of crime. And the member states are implementing these, um, these uh, dispositions of the action plan of ECOWAS that was from 2012. And there's more cooperation between the police and the, and the judicial system and uh, in a convention uh, of ECOWAS from 2002. So this, these conventions are, if you are d provide more dispositions, more means to uh, counter the crime and to sustain the convention's recommendations. And then of course, there's the ECOWAS convention also. There are many means that we can take. 
we realized that organized crime goes beyond borders and whatever it means it we must fight against it more efficiently we have to put into place regional strategies and this is what has brought us to where we are today we we are all working with the state members of ECOWAS. And this is also true for the states, valid for the states of CAC to fight against criminality. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, let us move on now. I think we want to improve our understanding on criminal access. Uh, maybe let me now move to 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 Catherine. Now, the, uh, maybe let us have a deeper understanding of the criminal actors in the context of organized crime index that we discussed in the first, uh, um, uh, the first webinar, because this index is extremely very important. Um, and the index describes four types of criminal actors who play key roles in transnational organized crime. Could you briefly explain these four types of actors and give us a specific example of each type? Sure. Um, so as Luca mentioned, um, in the first webinar, we had Ms. Laura Adal from the ENACT project present the organized crime index to us. And she briefly mentioned that there are four major types of criminal actors that we should be paying attention to and that the index is paying attention to. So I would like to first redisplay a slide that she used in her presentation and much of the content and the examples that I'll be referencing come from the rich range of resources that the index provides and that the organizations involved in the ENACT project have put out there. So one second while I share my screen. Okay, um, so from this slide, we can see that organized crime is being perpetrated by four different types of groups. We have state embedded actors, criminal networks, foreign actors, and mafia style actors. So I'll say a little bit about each. State embedded actors. These are people within the state who use their connections from their job in the state to facilitate organized crime. So this could be a wide range of people. It really depends on the context. It could be government ministers. It could be border police, customs officials, forest, forest service officers, civil servants who are granting business licenses or permits that might be needed to do business for interstate commerce, among other types of people who may be involved in some cases. So to give you an example, for instance, recently we saw in Chad that 10 people including several security sector officials and diplomats, were found guilty in the Chadian courts of trafficking tramadol, a synthetic drug that had come from India and was destined to move into Libya. Um, so this is an interesting example of how some state actors were involved in organized crime, but also an interesting example of how the justice system responded. Um, so that's an example of state embedded actors. Let's move to criminal networks, the second type of actor. The ENACT project describes these as loose networks of criminal associates who could be engaged in a variety of different types of criminal activity at any given time. They aren't necessarily actors who are very well known publicly to ordinary citizens. They aren't distinctly identifiable in the everyday to the people around them. And criminal network members don't usually control territory in the places where they're operating. So those are the key distinctions. Members of criminal networks could though have a diversity of backgrounds. So they can include people who are involved in illegal activity, but they can also include people who are involved in legitimate businesses that may serve as fronts for laundering money um, and, and the proceeds from organized criminal activities. Members of criminal networks could also include kingpins 
So those are people who are organizing and overseeing transnational organized crime operations. But members of criminal networks can also include smaller scale actors. And these small scale actors, some of them might be engaged in organized crime for profit, but others may merely be seeking a livelihood. And it's important in our policy responses to distinguish between these two types of small scale actors. So if we look, for example, at the human smuggling market in the Sahel, we can see that there are a wide variety of kingpins, large scale actors, small scale actors involved in this criminal chain. There are also people who are uh, just seeking a livelihood, who get involved on the fringes. And so making that distinction is key. The third kind of criminal actor, foreign actors. These are people who are doing organized crime from outside of their home country. And they're usually operating in neighboring countries, according to the index. However, we also see wider foreign involvement in organized crime in Africa. Asian involvement in flora and fauna trafficking in Africa, for example. We also know that Latin American cartels and South Asian criminal groups are sending drug shipments to different African countries on the coasts in particular. And one really interesting example that the ENACT project reports on in the index is that Mexican cartels are working with Nigerian actors in the Southwest um, in methamphetamine markets. Another example they give is that certain Lebanese diaspora business networks in Nigeria have been allegedly part of facilitating money laundering related to various forms of transnational organized crime. I should also add that we see foreign private sector companies sometimes involved in criminal networks as well. We see this in terms of illegal exports of timber from Central African Republic or Mozambique. And in more recent news, we've seen reports from Senegal and the Gambia of illegal, unregulated, and unreported fishing happening by foreign vessels, particularly Chinese trawlers in Senegalese and Gambian waters. And finally, the fourth type of criminal actor group to discuss today are mafia-style actors. Now, the ENACT project defines these actors as commonly identifiable groups that are well known by ordinary people uh, in the populace for conducting organized crime in the areas that they control. So usually mafia style groups have a known name. People know who they are. People know who their leaders are. They control some portion of territory in the places that they're doing crime. And members of the group are identifiable. Um, and so there are a few different examples of mafia style actors um, in Africa. We could point to gangs in major urban areas of South Africa that are engaged in say drug trafficking or reselling stolen vehicles. They control territory and they're well known. So they count as a mafia style group in many cases. You could also look in countries where you have active rebel groups that might be engaged in organized crime as a source of financing. We see this in Democratic Republic of Congo or Central African Republic. Some rebel groups are involved in various ways in illegal mining or wildlife trafficking, or they might be taxing the flows of other illicit products that come through the territory that they control, right? Al-Shabaab in Somalia, while a terrorist group, could also count as a mafia-style group engaged in organized crime by similar standards. You know, we've seen them either taxing illicit flows or recruiting organized criminals to be involved in a variety of different markets. Um, so one or both of those things we've seen happening in relation to human and drug trafficking, charcoal and sugar smuggling, and cattle rustling in the case of Al-Shabaab. So I'll stop there for now, Luca, on the four types. Excellent. Um, now at least we have defined, identify the criminal actors. Maybe. Catherine, I want to move in to highlight more about since we have these criminal actors, we may need to move understanding the presence and the activities on the continent. And I think the uh, the the organized crime index uh, provides a very good account of the activities and the presence of these four types of uh, criminal actors on the continent. So what should African, so the, the presence on the continent, and what would you share with the uh, African practitioners to know about how common different criminal actors are 
and about which types of actors are perceived or seen as most responsible for committing transnational organized crime. All right, well, um, I have probably three points to make here. So first, one thing that the ENACT Index is looking at to score criminality in various African countries, they are looking at the diversity and the degree of influence of these four different types of criminal actors. So in terms of scores um, each country has for criminal actors on the index, we see that on average across Africa in 2019, countries that had uh, a, a stronger criminal actor presence or degree of influence in their countries also tended to have less resilience to tr organized crime in general. Now, this is not necessarily a cause and effect relationship here, but we do see a correlation between countries that have higher levels of criminal actor activity and influence and those same countries having less resilience overall. So that's a first trend. In addition, if we break this down in terms of actor type, mafia style actors are the least prevalent um, or powerful kind of criminal actor in Africa, according to this index. Um, state embedded actors are identified on the index as the predominant perpetrators of organized crime across the continent. And again, according to the index, state embedded actors are also the criminal actors that people are perceiving as doing the most harm through their actions. They're often colluding with members of criminal networks to perpetrate organized crime that does major social, political, and economic harms in their countries. And the complicity of some of these high-level state actors in the corruption that might facilitate organized crime um, is well-documented by other sources as well, most notably the UN Economic Commission for Africa released a report a few years ago from the high level panel on illicit financial flows that makes reference to this pattern as well. So ultimately when state actors are facilitating transnational organized crime, this diverts tax revenue from the state, it deprives citizens of their rightful public resources, and it can also stunt growth and development. And it's this development that we need in the first place to prevent transnational organized crime from taking root or growing in strength in a society. So that's the first point. Um, the ENACT analysis um, also has notable trends related to countries in conflict. Many countries that are currently experiencing a protracted conflict or high levels of violence also show up in the high criminality category on the organized crime index. So this is the case for countries like Central African Republic, the DRC, Libya, South Sudan, Mali, Mozambique, uh, among others. And these countries have high criminality scores on the index because of the presence and the influence of criminal actors, as well as they have a high value or reach of criminal markets within their borders. So it's a combination of looking at the criminal actor presence and activity and the criminal market reach, um, reach and value um, that determines those high scores for countries that are in conflict. So we might want to think about what kinds of specialized strategies or knowledge sharing we can do to address organized crime in conflict settings in particular. And then we could do the same for countries that are in more stable or peaceful settings. And then finally, the analysis from the index points out that countries in which state embedded criminal actors have their highest levels of influence also tend to be countries that are more authoritarian, at least according to certain measures of this um, that are out there. And so that raises a final important point for us to consider in conjunction with the index. You know, it is that African Security and Justice Act's ability to counter the power of criminal actors comes from the social contract that they develop with citizens. And to deepen that social contract, we need things like a robust rule of law, a strong and free civil society, um, independent government oversight mechanisms that root out corruption, which facilitates organized crime. So encouraging or taking opportunities when they arise to push for these governance and oversight reforms is something that African security and justice actors can be involved in. And of course, it's a long game rather than a short-term thing, but that's the third point here. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, now, 
So, Councillor, let, let us move in now. We have identified the, uh, the, uh, the criminal actors and their presence and activities. Maybe we need also to understand more the domain within which they, they operate. And that's very important. I think the, the, the index itself provides a very good geographical distribution of different criminal markets and criminal actors that they choose to exploit. Uh, could you reflect on the types of organized crime that have the greatest risk, as well as the types of organized crime that are less widespread across the continent? But here I would like you really to focus on the domain on the criminal market. Okay, yes. Let me share one more slide from Laura Adal's presentation last time. Um, let me pull this up really quickly for everybody. Um, hold on a second. All right, so to look at criminal markets, here we go. So going back to this slide that we saw last time in the webinar, um, the Organized Crime Index tracks the value and the reach of 10 different major criminal markets in which we see organized crime. Human smuggling, human trafficking, arms trafficking, flora and fauna crimes, non-renewable resource crimes, the heroin trade, the cocaine trade, the cannabis trade, and the synthetic drugs trade. Um, and so I'll say a tiny bit about each. Human trafficking is the recruitment, harboring, transport, or transfer of people for the purposes of exploitation. It occurs through coercive means. So coercion, abduction, fraud, deception are involved. Human smuggling, a different market we're looking at here, is a bit different from human trafficking. It is the process through which individuals are voluntarily engaging in um, irregular migration, trying to illegally enter another country. And so while human smuggling by definition entails a voluntary but illicit movement across borders, human trafficking can occur within a country or across borders and it's coerced as opposed to voluntary. So that's how we differentiate those two markets. Um, all African countries are transit, source, and destination countries for human trafficking. And there are several major routes in Africa along which we see both human smuggling and elements of human trafficking taking place. Uh, you all know there is the route through the Sahel in North Africa to Europe. There is a route from the Horn of Africa and Eastern African countries down to South Africa. We frequently see labor migration, um, but also trafficking on that route. And then people move out of countries in the Horn of Africa to the Middle East and Gulf states as well. In terms of arms trafficking, particularly small arms and light weapons trafficking, this has been a major concern for many decades, right? We saw arms flows into Africa during the Cold War that contributed to this kind of crime. And more recent events like the fall of Gaddafi in Libya led to an outflux of arms in the wider Sahel Sahara that's had lasting effects on arms trafficking throughout the continent. So many of the small arms we see in transit these days come from government or United Nations stockpiles. Then in terms of wildlife crimes, um, in terms of fauna, Interpol identifies um, key major threats across the continent to be um, trafficking in elephant ivory, great apes, rhino horn, and pangolin scales. Um, Illegal, unregulated, and unreported fishing is, of course, also a major concern. And in terms of flora crimes, we often hear about illegal logging as a major issue. So that includes the illicit trade in rare hardwoods. And in terms of non-renewable resource crimes, a very prominent trend, especially in the Gulf of Guinea area, is oil bunkering. Finally, drugs markets. They're very diverse if you look across the continent. So West and Eastern African coasts became prime transshipment points for drug trafficking to Europe, particularly as of the 1990s and the 2000s. Cocaine is a popular drug market across West Africa in particular, and Interpol identifies several countries in Central Africa as cocaine transit hubs as well. Heroin trafficking, you see it in some of these countries, but it's extremely uh, marked and along the East African coast in particular. We see cannabis trafficking common across all regions of Africa and synthetic drugs like tramadol or methamphetamine are also part of drug markets in certain parts of the continent. So overall, 
Some types of organized crime are more evenly spread across the continent than others. So we see more widespread occurrence of things like human trafficking, poaching, resource crimes, natural resource theft, and arms trafficking, for instance. So that's why you see here the higher criminal market scores for some of those things. Um, drug markets are, tend to be more concentrated in specific countries or specific neighborhoods within particular regions of Africa, other than cannabis, which is more widespread as a drug market. Um, but all of these forms of organized crime that were measured on the ENACT index are, of course, still significant threats to national and citizen security and to social well-being. So I'll leave it at that, Luca. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Catherine. Now, let me conclude um, uh, with, uh, with you. Now, we are very clear now with the criminal actors who are now clear of criminal markets. And then we want to move in to, look, to see to what level can we link these criminal actors, criminal markets, or transnational organized crime with a specific, um, uh, a specific threat that facing Africa, that is terrorism. So in your own opinion and based on your own experience, um, to what extent do the laws in African states differentiate between transnational organized crime and terrorism? And what are the consequences of the linkage between transnational organized crime and terrorism for the development of its strategic approaches to counter organized crime? Okay, Hello. okay, so Hello. Thank guys. you. Yes, thank you. I'm here. Thank you very much. Thank you for that question. With respect to this link that you were mentioning, I would like to go back to the topic of the markets that Catherine was uh, defining and, and link that with terrorism. And I would explain this by saying that organized crime basically is a response to the services. It's and so services or the, the demand for services is really at the heart of the transnational crime activities. If you look at the markets, you've got human smuggling, you've got flora and fauna trafficking, drug trafficking, and so forth. And you can see that in reality, uh, they need, uh, for th this is a matter of uh, providing services, but for terrorists, they need to fund their activities. And all of their activities are funded through criminal activities. And it's these same criminal activities that Catherine was just describing. It's the same markets that they're using. So the terrorists are using the same markets as the organized crime networks. And even the same geographic zones are being used. If I give you the example of the Sahel, if you look in Niger, in Niger, this is a zone that uh, where there's an enormous amount of uh, counterfeiting and the terrorists are also using these networks. So the links that exist between transnational crime and terrorism are very direct links. Now, of course, notwithstanding ideological uh, considerations that terrorists might have certain ideologies, or you have to look at it from the point of from the point of view of it being simply uh, that they are also opportunists. They are seeing how they can use these illegal activities or criminal ac activities to generate. Uh, profits and to be able to fund their their activities, their terrorist activities. So there is a convergence of interests between uh, transnational organized criminal groups and terrorists. And as I was saying, uh, terrorist and organized criminal groups share the same spaces, the same zones, and they are also also uh, using the same types of methodologies or, or tactics to control the routes, to work against the government, and so forth. In our African states, a lot of them have legislation where they do make a distinction between terrorism and organized crime. But I think that it's purely ideological, insofar as, as I was saying earlier, there might be two different crimes that are different, but there's an overlap. They overlap in that terrorist groups 
who normally would limit themselves to terrorist activities, use the same tactics and methods as organized criminal groups. And so that also sort of puts them in the category of organized criminal groups. And it's difficult sometimes to distinguish them between them. And the difficulty, uh, if you are to look at this at the state level, is that sometimes there's a lack of coordination, a lack of coordination between all the different actors, the uh, law enforcement groups, the judges, the judicial system, those who are supposed to be uh, overseeing financial investigations. So there's lack of coordination amongst all these groups. But we do, we have come to the point where we need to change our paradigm. We need a new paradigm. We have to have a more balanced approach. And we need to, of course, focus on law enforcement. That's an, inf an essential aspect. You have to fight these crimes. But we also have to focus on social and economic rights, and the, which is highly linked to these responses. But also when you look at the repressive aspect, the law enforcement aspect, and how you can manage this whole phenomenon, I think you have to focus very closely on intelligence. Intelligence is essential. Actors involved in security need and in, in uh, law enforcement need to be able to anticipate uh, these activities and and prevent them. But this so this requires good intelligence, but also good coordination, both at the national level, but the international level as well. Because you cannot fight transnational crime uh, without having good intelligence and without having coordination. People, both at the internal level or the intergovernmental level, have to have good systems for coordination between the, the police, the gendarmerie, the financial investigators. They have to be able to exchange intelligence in real time because the, the criminals are, are fast. They're working very quickly. And so all the different agencies have to also be able to exchange information in real time. And sometimes there may be some successes in terms of countering transnational crime, but maybe we don't always know this ever in all the other agencies because because sometimes we don't share this experience or this information. So we also have to be able to follow the trail of money because sometimes you might be able to have a success in one, but you aren't able to take down the entire network unless you're able to follow the money trail. So for financial crimes, uh, for confiscation, when you are confiscating financial proceeds from these illegal crimes, this all has to be approaches that we adopt as well so that we can follow the money trail and continue taking down these networks. And then in terms of uh, strategies, states need to have strategies at the judicial level as well. Fortunately, a lot of uh, countries are adopting um, uh, these strategies and specialized divisions, judicial p p divisions, that work together both on terrorist issues and transnational crime. And I think it's very good for the judicial system to have these specialized legal centers, if you will, or agencies that work both on transnational crime and terrorism. And I think that when we look at uh, combating transnational crime, we have to have an intergovernmental task force, an interagency task force. You have to include everybody, immigration, uh, law enforcement, uh, financial investigator teams, intelligence services. But really, what is important for our continent is that we still have to have a reliable civil society. I think that until we can also have strong, robust civil societies, we're not going to be able to be successful because it's very difficult sometimes to fight people, fight against these groups when we don't know them. So if we are able to identify them within the population, because uh, some people, some countries don't have reliable information. And if we don't have a holistic approach to this issue, because if we're looking at it part and parcel, we're looking at it sector by sector, we're not going to be successful. We have to have a holistic approach. We have to see how we can set up an interagency task force, and gradually keep working together to uh, be able to tackle these issues. And I think this is what's going to enable us to really uh, deal with this issue of both transnational crime and terrorism. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a very good way of concluding our webinar. Um, um, I just want to conclude, yes, we first, I hope we set to ourselves three objectives for for us to have a better understanding of 
criminality in terms of the criminal actors and criminal markets. I think Drum concluded very well how to link this transnational organized crime with terrorism. I hope we have succeeded in doing that. And for the participant, please, I urge you to look at these three documents that are very important. The one, it is on organized crime index, and I think it is in your uh, material. It is something you can access. It is well written, it's simple. You can be able to, to, to and you will get a lot of information about it, even about your country. Second, please, the UN Lermo Convention is extremely important because it is the commitment of your member state of how to define and to counter transnational organized crime. And if possible, look at the experience of ECOWAS. Uh, like what Graham said, it is very important because it is when you have a convention at, at high level, it is a different thing at the local level. That's the idea of sharing experiences among ourselves. And I think we can make a difference with this webinar. At least we can be able to advance, as I mentioned earlier, advance African security for our citizens if we have a very effective policies and, and strategies to counter some of these threats facing the continent. Now, so, so I, I hope our conversation with these great two panelists might have helped us in having such a good understanding. So let me thank, and on your behalf, the excellent work done by these two panelists, uh, because they have indeed help us to understand criminality and its presence on the continent.